and gentlemen, and welcome to another webinar from the Philips Lighting University. Today's webinar is titled Human Centric Lighting, and it will be presented to you by Bianca van der Zande, who is a senior scientist at Philips Research, uh, together with Patricia Rizzo, lighting application developer at Philips Lighting. I'm very pleased to see the uh, high interest uh, in uh, this uh, topic of uh, human centric lighting. Um, so, um, human centric lighting is uh, devoted to uh, enhancing human performance, comfort, health, and well being, and is uh, currently uh, uh, next to smart and connected lighting embraced as a key theme. Um, into the transformation of the light industry uh, towards digital. And uh, that's what you can see if you look into conference programs and uh, on social media. Uh, so I think that's uh, more or less a basis of uh, touching upon uh, human-centric lighting in the broadest sense. After listening to this seminar, you will have learned what human-centric lighting design entails and why it may become such an important team for the future of lighting. Um, so you will be able to differentiate between visual and non-visual needs, understand the essence and limitations of the newest scientific insights, learn some application techniques, and also learn some available technologies uh, uh, that can be uh, an enabler for human-centric lighting. So Patricia and I, um, decided to um, organize the webinar in two parts. So one uh, is more the theoretical basis on human-centric lighting, and the other part um, uh, will be more uh, how you can do it in practice. Uh, that will be presented by uh, uh, Patricia. Uh, so why human-centric lighting? Well, that has all to do that people need light. Uh, without natural light, there is actually no life. And light affects us in a variety of ways, visually, emotionally, and biologically. The most obvious effect of light on humans is vision. First of all, light allows to experience the world around us, to see the smallest details, pers details perspective, depth and colors. And sight is considered as the most important sense for humans, and some even mention, although uh, this is uh, actually very difficult uh, to confirm, that more than 80% of uh, our information we, we receive comes through sight. And it takes about 50% of our brain capacity to process all this information. And moreover, and I think that may be uh, less well known, is the role that light can play for proper eye growth, required for optimum vision during lifetime. For instance, myopia research has indicated that the risk to develop myopia is considerably increased when children have limited uh, bright light exposure. So additionally, light is demonstrated to be the most powerful regulator of the human day-night rhythm. And evolution has adapted us to outdoor light and natural outdoor levels. And hence, evolution has shaped us to live in daylight. It tells the body to be awake during daytime and to be alert and be able to perform. Daylight delivers the winning combination of the right light with the right spectral content at the right time. And uh, there's a lot uh, written about it, and uh, there's a nice uh, review uh, by uh, Slange uh, that you can find on the web. However, although light is so important to humans, nowadays we spend 90% of our time indoor, even children. So that makes that the indoor environment uh, becomes paramount for our general sense of well-being and health, instead of... Uh, yeah. So, these, daylight, uh, these indoor lighting conditions, however, do not deliver the light nutrition that people need to stay healthy during lifetime. For instance, a sunny outdoor day prov provides 100,000 lux, um, and a very dull, cloudy, rainy day still provides 2,000 lux. Indoors, though, 
light levels are generally a quarter of that or less. Besides receiving too little light during the day, we receive too much light in the evening. The presence of light during the evening and night delays our sleep onset. For instance, by being out in Times Square in the evening, it really feels like daytime due to the excessive vertical illumination of the giant building displays. Or even maybe a bit closer to some people's home is uh, the effect of uh, computer screens or smartphones on the onset of sleep. So the lack of light during the day combined with too much light during the evening causes uh, sleep deprivation to many of us. Instead of eight hours sleep a night that a lot of us need, uh, we now get an average of around six and a half. And that's uh, not enough. And having said that, if you look into the research on what tiredness does, you can see that tiredness is linked to a huge number of psychological effects. Stress and mistakes, as well as poor judgment, uh, memory, concentration, etc. And there are even reported links with medical effects. Excessive use of drugs and stimulants, obesity, uh, maybe even a lower immunity, or cardiovascular diseases. And a lot of uh, information can be found on the negative effects of sleep uh, deprivation on emotional, uh, cognitive and social responses. I've plotted a few here. So these trends in general, um, uh, uh, these trends in general population health combined with the change towards an indoor lifestyle is one of the triggers uh, for healthy building design to consider human-centric lighting in building design. So, but then is the biggest question is why is it actually popping up now? Because uh, quite some research is not um, completely new. And the reason why it's popping up now is that LED technology makes light much more energy efficient and allows for spectral tuning more easily. Uh, furthermore, uh, the connected lighting uh, technology allows for personalization, easy control, censoring, and as such creates flexibility in lighting design. And last but not least, uh, in 2002, the discovery of the third photoreceptor um, led to the conclusion that light is the paramount trigger for our circadian rhythm. And it revealed new pathways in the brain providing information on how light affects people. And this actually brings me to the second part of uh, my part, of the theoretical part, and that is all about through which pathways light affects people. And uh, I will give some examples on published uh, data and, uh, and the mechanism. So first of all, as uh, said in the introduction, what do we mean with human-centric lighting? And uh, then I think that uh, uh, Peter Boyce made a nice uh, definition or description of it. And that's that uh, human-centric lighting is lighting that is devoted to enhancing human performance, comfort, health and well-being. And that can be separately or in some combination. Um, that means that in lighting design, one should consider the three functions of light. First of all, functional light, which not only prevents discomfort, but actually creates optimum eye comfort and facilitates user activities such as concentration, creativity and task at hand. Then we have the function of biological light, often also referred to as circadian light, is designed to optimally address our non-visual pathway and to support uh, the sleep-wake cycle of people. And then we have the third function of light, which is emotional light, and that is related to an environment that we uh, perceive intuitively as comfortable or safe 
or relates to the time of the day, or that uh, gives us a good feeling. And true human-centric lighting creates a lighting design that properly addresses these functions of light. And to do so, one needs to understand human perception, lighting application, and the pathways through which lighting affects the human being. So let me elaborate a bit on that one. So light impacts people through two pathways. Uh, first, the visual pathway, which is uh, uh, figured out uh, here. So the visual pathway is activated by the, when uh, the rods and cones in the eye capture the light and sends the electric signal through the visual cortex. Um, while the non-visual pathway is activated when the signal is captured by the third photoreceptor sending a message to the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain. So let me first elaborate a bit on the visual pathway. So the visual pathway, we don't think about it, but it's actually a quite complex process using a lot of mental resources. And that's why I would like to elaborate a bit more on it. So uh, we have two as aspects of visual pathway. We have the visual performance, and we have the visual experience. Uh, so what happens? The eye captures the light and projects it on the retina, and the retina sends a message uh, through the visual cortex. And in the end, uh, we call it vision. The visual cortex is a beautiful stepwise uh, pathway to enable an interpretation of the captured light. It analyzes the electric signals and interprets it, resulting in a conscious image that people can interpret and put in a context, and we call that vision. Obviously, the effort to interpret these incoming electric signals depends strongly on the quality of the optical system, or our eye, but also on the quality of the reflected signals from the object, how that come into the eye, in relation to the light, the signals that come directly into the eye or through the ambient environment. Um, so the effort for nearby vision, like reading or screen work, depends on the quality of the optical system. So this next slide shows a bit the effect of object size and contrast. And, and this obviously has a relation with how well you are able to perform. So the larger the object and the larger the contrast, the faster you can interpret the object. So the less effort you need to understand that detail. And the following slide shows the effect of light intensity, as reported by Adrian. This figure demonstrates that uh, on, the, on, the, on this axis you can see the visual acuity. So the smaller the, de the here you have small details, and these are the larger details. And it's plotted against the background luminance. And then you can see that if the background luminance increases, people are able to see smaller details up till the saturation uh, uh, part. And people and other studies indicate that under bright light conditions that people can read faster and that uh, literacy skills can go up. For instance, as reported by Mott or Barkman. Furthermore, it is also shown that this saturation point becomes higher with age. Uh, Sagawa, for instance, demonstrated that the 60-year-old needs about 10 times as much light as a 20-year-old. To, same the same to see the same detail. So at the last slide on visual performance, I would like to demonstrate this visual uh, uh, illusion. And this is to let you feel that vision is an effort. And it takes uh, effort to interpret the information that is captured by the eyes. You probably can feel your eyes. Uh, now working, 
And this demonstrates that fission actually costs energy. And something that costs energy can make you fatigued in the long run. And fatigue and happiness, as well as fatigue and performance, they are interlinked. So for good building design or for a, a good um, environment for, uh, for instance, elderly, it's important to take into account also the visual uh, pathway in your lighting design. Uh, but next to uh, the visual performance, we also have something we call the visual ex uh, experience. And the visual experience is of, of importance in, an, in addressing uh, the unconscious effects of light, uh, such as direction, uh, for instance, or the, the, um, creating a natural indoor environment. And the Danish artist, Daniel Riebakken, plays with these unconscious effects that we automatically have by simulating the direction and the natural effects of daylight in his artwork. And that's demonstrated in this one. This is just art. It, it, it suggests that there is daylight and that there is a window somewhere there, but there isn't. And the tricks here are the soft edges combined with the play in gray contrast that brings the illusion of having daylight entry. And that influences your emotion and mood. And as with many so-called illu illusions, this effect really demonstrates the success rather than the failure of our visual system. Uh, the visual system is not very good at being a physical light meter, but that's not its purpose. The important task is to break the image formation down into meaningful components and thereby perceive the nature of the objects in view. And for environments where people spend most of their time, it's important that the visual cortex can easily perceive uh, the nature of the objects in view. And this picture demonstrates artwork of Carlos Cruz Diaz actually creating the opposite feeling if you are in there. Being in this space, you feel completely disoriented. So in other words, light also sends a message, and the perceived message may affect our mood, motivation and behavior, according to some scientific papers. However, results are not always consistent. Uh, this reflects, in my opinion, the fact that although we understand visual performance very well, the pathways on how we interpret the space and what that does to our emotions and behavioral consequences are not yet clarified in a scientific way. So I would like to, uh, to close the visual uh, pathway with the following statement, that there is a relevance also for a comfortable environment and a highlighting appraisal. And that's stated in here. So what you can see that people who appraise their lighting as good will also appraise the room as more attractive and with that be in a more pleasant mood and more satisfied with, in this case, the work environment. And they will be also more engaged um, in their work according to, uh, to Fitch. So that closes off the, uh, the visual pathway information. But as said, there's also the second pathway, which is the non-visual pathway. And the non-visual pathway affects us via the acute system and via our circadian system. The circadian is very well investigated, uh, and I will uh, come back on that one. And there's also the other one, sometimes referred to as the fast pathway, where the suprachiasmatic nuclei uh, sends out directly uh, messages. Um, and uh, I think the next, uh, the next slide gives the scientific uh, representation. I will uh, skip that uh, due of time. But I think important to understand is that uh, there are a lot, of, uh, lot more processes uh, interacting uh, or entrained with light uh, but we haven't, uh, we don't understand them yet in their complete sense. Um, so, 
As said, uh, we have this acute uh, uh, effect. And acute effects are mostly studied via alertness uh, measures or uh, sleepiness uh, scales. And here you can find an example of a study um, uh, done by uh, Kajochen demonstrating the dose response function of subjective alertness um, versus uh, the illuminance level at the eye. And people were exposed uh, during night for six and a half hours to a certain uh, light setting. And here you, this graph indicates that people that were exposed to bright light uh, for six and a half hours during the night, they were feeling more alert than the people that were under dimmed uh, light levels. And um, so the effect of evening light on alertness and hence the lack of sleepiness is also confirmed in studies uh, towards, for instance, the effects of blue and rich light uh, from television, computers and tablets. So in one sense it's good for people that have 24-7 hours uh, rhythm, but it's not so good for people that uh, stay at home, want to relax and go uh, to sleep uh, afterwards. Um, so how, if I then continue um, to the circadian system, and I have to say here it's a bit difficult to uh, separate uh, at this uh, moment uh, the acute and circadian part. It's not that well described yet, but acute effects might intervene with the circadian effects. So let me touch upon, uh, upon uh, that. So. Evening, uh, so as I said, light during the evening might impair uh, sleep. Um, and um, that's demonstrated here. And I try to demonstrate the, uh, the research done by Santi, uh, who has shown the effect of evening light on the sleep onset. And in this figure, what you can see here, is uh, on this axis, on the uh, vertical axis, the melatonin concentration. And uh, melatonin is associated with, uh, with uh, the sleepiness uh, of people, it's a sleep hormone, with respect to the time uh, to, uh, to bed. And what you can see here is that the respondents that were under dimmed uh, light levels, they had at the natural uh, moment uh, they started to uh, uh, increase their melatonin concentration. So at the moment they wanted to go to bed, they were sleepy, and they had a rapid sleep onset. On the other hand, people that were exposed to very blue light, you can see that uh, there the melatonin concentration remained very low, and that resulted in a very slow sleep onset. And for the... Uh, yeah, for the middle one you can see that also incandescent light at, uh, well, uh, 135 lux. It also um, impairs uh, the sleep onset, but of course less than blue and rich light, uh, as you can see in this, uh, in this figure. So the second effect of, uh, of light is actually morning light. Uh, morning light wakes you up by suppressing the sleep uh, hormone melatonin. Uh, and that allows uh, cortisol to be produced. And I also have a research example that, uh, that demonstrates this. Uh, it's done by the University of Groningen. And uh, here you can see the increase in cortisol levels for three different stages of waking up. Uh, so if you look at the gray bars in this bar, you can see that the uh, total increase in cortisol level is, is low. And this is the situation that people are woken up with, without uh, a light intervention. And if you then uh, also shut on the, the light, as is demonstrated here, uh, so you go from dark suddenly to light, you can see that the increase in cortisol levels is much higher than without the light. And you can even uh, do it more friendly by simulating uh, the dawn, a very gradually increase in, uh, in light, 
And then you can see that the increase in cortisol levels is even more. Um, so user experience of more than 200 respondents in this type of uh, 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 wake-up uh, procedure indicated that this very gradual increase indeed uh, improves the wake-up experience and is more pleasant and uh, that it feels uh, more natural. The last of the third uh, uh, important effect of, uh, of light is a sharp contrast actually between day and night because that can help regulate the sleep uh, patterns. And especially uh, bright light in the morning can provide for a good difference between sleepiness and wakefulness state. And this um, uh, determines the amplitudes of the circadian stages. Um, so let me show here. Uh, if you do that, then people, uh, bright light during the day can thus help people to feel active and motivated or even to perform or sleep well uh, during the night. And uh, this is a research example uh, which shows raw activity data for patients with uh, Alzheimer's uh, diseases. And they are assessed over three periods of uh, five days. And what you can see here in the first uh, graph is a very erratic uh, behavior of the, of the black bars, uh, in the, yeah, uh, showing that uh, there is no uh, real um, uh, sleep-wake cycle uh, with these respondents. Then the middle uh, graph shows uh, the responses of the uh, uh, raw activity data when the Alzheimer patients were um, under bright light during the day. And here you can see this rhythm, that the sleep rhythm comes actually back, uh, which is uh, yeah, considered as a very positive uh, item. At the moment you uh, get rid of the, uh, the bright light in the, uh, during the day, you can see that the old erratic pattern uh, pops up uh, again. Um, so this was for Alzheimer patients, but there has been done uh, reported more studies uh, that exposure to higher illuminance level during the day can result in feelings of increased alertness and better performance, for instance, for officers. Uh, but there are also reports for people um, spending time in hospitals or psychiatric wards or even uh, in, uh, for post-operative uh, delirium uh, aspects. And for instance, you can see that uh, depressed patients had a three-day um, shorter duration if they have daylight access of, or, or bright light exposure. And uh, there are also reports that the uh, prevalence of uh, post-operative uh, delirium crisis rate uh, uh, were reduced. So uh, to summarize, light during the day and darkness during the night is essential for human light. And it affects uh, all yeah, alertness, concentration, but also the experience of the environment and sleep. And indirectly, it uh, affects uh, our behavior, uh, even our growth and memory, for instance. Um, so people need light for their, uh, their performance, comfort, health and well-being. Uh, but in, as said, in modern society, people do not get enough light nutrition due to their indoor lifestyles. And um, this in combination with smart LED lighting and the maturity of science grows the interest of human-centric lighting as a means for well-building design. Um, so, uh, and what that means, how to do it in practice, will be uh, discussed uh, by, uh, by Patricia. So we'll talk a little bit about um, how to apply this, this idea of human-centric lighting, some application and design, and examples and some techniques and technologies that uh, we have in our toolbox. So why are we looking out a window onto a beachfront in this slide? Because connections to nature are usually welcome and often soothing. Humans seek that connection, and providing it in our designs is desired more and more these days. In the following slides, we'll take a look at a couple of application examples, as well as techniques used in developing the application 
and some technologies available in the designer's toolbox today. There are five lighting characteristics that are very important, not only to human-centric lighting, but actually all lighting for both our visual and non-visual systems. Intensity, which is the amount of light delivered to the retina, or vertical illumination for especially circadian lighting, light that's not delivered to the horizontal task plane, but actually to the eye itself. That is the important piece. Day Daylight or lighting systems that deliver light to overhead and vertical surfaces, such as walls and partitions, deliver these light levels. The distribution of light is very important as well. Lighting applications research recognizes the role of brightness perception of the space or vertical planes and luminous contrast. Indications are that it supports people's energy perception during the day. Spectral content spectrum of a light source, the photoreceptors that transmit the non-visual signals to the brain operate at peak sensitivity to blue light. So this is seen more and more um, as an important element for us to introduce in our designs as well. And duration and time of day, blue light will suppress melatonin secretion. And melatonin, as Bianca has uh, explained, is known as the sleep hormone. So as a result, a higher intensity of blue-rich light at night delays sleep while high-intensity blue-rich light early in the day can increase morning alertness. The impact of spectral content and reduced or increased intensity can be intensified or decreased by the duration of exposure, how long you're exposed to this light source. So there's a trade-off among these factors, meaning that an increase or decrease in one can often be compensated by an increase or decrease in another. <clears throat> so... Human-centric lighting in practice, we will just um, look at what, <clears throat> how, to, how to combine, actually, how to marry the visual and non-visual needs, what would be important as far as um, not forgetting functional lighting, because often today we focus on the non-visual, so there is also an important um, focus that needs to be had for the amount of light people need to get through their days. It's very important to provide the right amount of light for any of the tasks that we're doing, um, whether it's chopping vegetables or looking for veins to detect illness, um, working on an assembly line. So for visual, highly visual acuity uh, intensive tasks, we need some good fun functional lighting. So we'll take a little look at uh, what some nurses say and what, um, how they respond to the environments that they're working in. Um, what I say often now is vertical is the new horizontal because we have to focus on light reaching the eye and that's not a measurement that we were always um, in tune with up until now. And then we'll take a look at a couple of examples and technologies. So with um, typical patient rooms, general patient rooms, we actually um, worked a little bit with Pacific Northwest National Labs, and they recently distributed a survey to nurses in several hospitals on the West Coast, inquiring about their experience with regard to lighting in the patient rooms in which they work. 252 nurses responded. The lighting issues that they addressed included color of light, how, how lighting affects your ability to evaluate skin tones and colors in the room, um, how, how easily they were able to control the lights, how accessible they were, did they have switches, dimmers, or other devices that would make it easier for them, was flicker an issue or glare, or especially light level, was it sufficient or insufficient, and, and those types of, um, those types of uh, elements that could be helpful or bothersome in their daily work. So they ranked their responses uh, according to age, which was very interesting. And then one, of course, was the hot, largest impact, and seven was the, had the least impact. So as we can see, um, for all age groups, under 25 to over 55, light level, sufficient or insufficient, ranked number one. Control, again, accessibility, uh, ease of, of accessing them, convenient locations was number two and color of light, whether it was warm or cool or enhanced uh, other colors in the room or their ability to um, evaluate skin tones was number three across the board. But when we look at the glare issue, um, it's particularly um, stunning that 
once you hit age 41, and anyone between the ages of 41 and 55, glare was their next most important um, element. And then over 55, um, glare certainly, um, again, most important. But under 55, under 25, glare was the least important. So for all ages, from under 25 to over 55, the top three issues ranked were light level, control, and color. But um, obviously, the aging eye is a consideration for visual needs, and the aging population touches all career segments today. So human-centric lighting in patient rooms. Um, we have seen that in hospitals, this can improve the amount of time it takes patients to fall asleep, and as well as staff satisfaction. A solution called HealWell in Europe aims to bring the benefits of daylight indoors and support a patient's biorhythm by the use of a low-luminance, tunable white luminaire, one that was able to change color temperature and intensity from morning till night. In addition, it enhanced the patient experience by allowing personal control of the wall wash colors and reading light, while staff was able to override the system when they needed to. There is evidence to support this. In a study completed over the course of nine months at Maastricht University Cardiology Center in the Netherlands, 140 patients were monitored, comparing four control rooms with four heel well equipped rooms. When assessing the change from the first night to the seventh night, results pointed to improved falling asleep time and longer time remaining asleep, and overall higher patient and staff satisfaction. So looking at another example of a patient room, um, this is a model of one that is actually being designed. In addition to visual needs, uh, functional lighting criteria need to be met, such as the minimum horizontal and vertical luminance levels needed for functional tasks. Example, a thousand lux on the bed when physicians need to examine the patient high color rendering to see the veins and detect diseases, and shielding angles to avoid glare. There are also non-visual criteria to meet, however. Providing a dynamic lighting system that supports a patient's 24-hour rhythms by varying color temperatures throughout the day, and one that allows personal control of all luminaires in the room, and allows improved interaction and conversation between patients, staff, and families, also complements visual needs, so a holistic approach. Is, is very recommended. Patient room design, in this instance, we see the transition in color temperatures from very cool earlier in the day to neutral um, in the middle of the day to warmer tones as you wind down and get ready to sleep at night. There's also daylight contribution in the family area where we see that um, on the left near the window. And here we are also providing uh, wall controls in the various zones around the room so that everyone can control their own lighting and not interfere with the other if possible. And the patient, one of the big complaints from patients is that they are usually left with lights on when someone leaves the room inadvertently and they are unable to control that. So um, that's another consideration here, giving them the ability to control or at least turn off all the lights in the room. So while washing the walls with color can simulate a natural daylight sequence or reinforce the feel of sunrise and sunset, that, in addition to views to the outdoors, can fulfill psychological or emotional needs of someone in a hospital room for any length of time, whether patient or family member. And another important thing to consider is the risk of falls. This is a very, very large problem for older adults especially. So providing perceptual cues, linear um, recessed lighting or, or um, wall-mounted lighting that can give the patient the ability to uh, stabilize their posture as they step out of bed it is found to be very helpful in addition to recessed night lights. So providing low, very warm, even amber 590 nanometer light as a night lighting system in the room is highly recommended. Um, not only... This is receiving special attention in hospitals, not only due to the injury to the patient, but 
the associated liability. Hospitals in the U.S. are no longer reimbursed for preventable injuries sustained while someone is in the hospital. Another study has shown that the pathway lights plus night lights can also increase the gait velocity, how quickly someone can walk. So giving them this integrated system where it's not just um, a general lighting in the room or just a night light, but the combination of visual cues and low-level lighting um, can help reduce um, the risk of falls, which is, again, um, a big, very big issue. And this um, is one of my favorites. You know, we underestimate, I think, we underappreciate the benefit of a windowed space. So windows and daylight and how does that affect stress and, and the feeling you have when you are at work. Nurses often don't have access to daylight. They, their nurses stations are sometimes in the core of the hospital, so they're not, you know, they don't have access to windows. So nurses who are working in units with windows versus windowless units experienced higher levels of communication and laughter. And I have never really heard that as an outcome, but what better metric for human-centric lighting can there be than that? So now let's take a quick look at some office, office spaces, which are a challenge today because they are changing. So today the, um, office, the challenge is to develop innovative office lighting systems that consider all manner of energy. They're both energy effective and energizing at the same time. Through lighting, they can provide an environment for thought and creativity that may boost mental resources while conserving electric energy as well, that are energy efficient but are also comfortable and inspiring. So they need to do quite a lot to make people happy and productive these days. Here are a few examples of some different types of office spaces as they are evolving. Work environments are designed differently today. There are gathering or teaming areas, open office spaces, much um, fewer private offices, and more collaborative spaces, presenting opportunities to learn, brainstorm, focus, or even socialize. So an example, looking at a plan view of a sample office, um, as it's being designed today, we have ergonomically designed furniture and adjustable height desks, so why not lighting that adapts to an individual's needs or preferences? In the open areas, in the center of the room, um, not all workers have as much exposure to daylight as they do around the perimeter. So how do you strike a balance? Well, by providing adjustability in the lighting in these areas, perhaps a tunable white lighting system, one that changes color temperatures throughout the day, provides an energy boost early in the day and calming light when desired, some personal control, additional task lighting or higher ambient levels according to the time of day and season, some increased light on the walls surrounding the non-daylit spaces, for vertical brightness and visual interest, and in the teaming areas, um, differentiate the lighting from open spaces to identify it as a place to collaborate, think, and create. And in this um, example, it's just a, a, some perspective of the plan, but it shows you, you know, in this, in this teaming area, how can you differentiate? Well, adjustable lighting, um, whether it's different color temperatures or the ability to increase or decrease intensity or a different look of the light completely um, could help um, as far as people getting together and, and, you know, generating some great ideas and... and uh, being excited about what they're doing. And then you have these corridors where there are, you know, transition spaces. So you need to try to create a balance um, and, and people can adapt to higher and lower light levels as they walk through, you know, some of these in-between spaces. So many things to consider for the population in offices today. And then, again, providing visual interest, which is so important. Um, these luminous panels are you know, just a great way to provide interest and in contrast and vertical brightness and um, eliminate the, the, the need for as much general ambient lighting. It's, you know, emotional lighting is supportive to a positive work environment. And providing visual interest in lines of sight adds elements of comfort, perhaps nature, increases, as we say, the vertical brightness, allowing lower ambient levels, and uh, all this can impact psychological well-being. Another great example of a technique is um, the blending of light and acoustics. 
This slide shows before and after images of an, off, an open office plan. In the top image, um, obviously, using recessed fluorescent luminaires, the office has an almost cave-like appearance, while in the bottom image, the appearance is light and open, even uplifting. These photos are, are results from a field study conducted at the Innovation Center of the Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm, Sweden, to validate the benefits of what is called sound light comfort sealing at a customer site. This is a unique sealing tile system that integrates acoustics and lighting and creates a totally new experience. Psychological comfort is essential for cognitive, in cognitive performance, perceived stress, daytime alertness, and reduced evening fatigue, which is validated in this study. These factors are critical for work effectiveness, satisfaction, and physical and psychological well-being, and hence employee productivity. So here's a, another um, interesting way to look at the benefits of transforming a workplace, integrating human-centric lighting. Lighting standards that prescribe minimum task illuminance and prevention of discomfort glare will minimize resource depletion and provide physical comfort. Also, if lighting conditions promote user activities, mental resources are conserved, leading to functional comfort. Finally, psychological comfort by replenishing mental resources might be realized when light settings meet user expectations, preferences, visual and non-visual needs. For example, lighting comfort and room appearance have been demonstrated to play a role in job satisfaction, retention, and absence from work, error rates, and employee engagement. As such, as such psychological comfort tips the balance from your workplace being a cost center to becoming a profit-generating asset to your corporation. So there's a different way to think about it. So now we'll just look at a couple of um, technologies that enable us to provide these dynamic um, lighting conditions in different situations, whether it's hospitals, offices, schools, um, many, many different types of applications. We have um, static white to two-channel tunable white lighting to multi-channel specially adaptable light. We have all the um, tools in our toolbox that enable us to provide these different, these different environments. There are benefits and trade-offs depending on the complexity of the system that we use. Because as we increase the complexity, as we increase potential circadian benefit by um, introducing you know, spectral tunability, the, effic the efficacy of the system may decrease. We're adding um, you know, longer wavelengths, shorter wavelengths. Um, it could you know, really affect um, lumens per watt if that becomes uh, an important criterion. But the trade-offs are you know, something to be considered and controls are very important. So um, when, how do we decide? When you know, We have choices in tunable technologies today. The tunable white gives us um, two extremes along the black body and actually a couple of um, con correlated col color temperatures that fall below the black body if we want to set some points to uh, be able to change the, the warmness or the, the coolness of the light throughout the day. And uh, multi-channel, we can have more than two channels of so just white light along the black body. We can introduce color. Um, there may be multicolor LED chips in, in a system. So when do we need more than a single channel? For which applications would we desire? Two channel or four channel or five channel? You know, there are different objectives that may be part of a design that would um, make that decision for us. So many choices to consider when investing in human-centric lighting and spectrally tunable lighting um, is just one tool that we can use. Here's an example of what they would look like um, on the right. We see an example of two-channel tunable white. These luminaires are able to transition from 2,700 Kelvin to 6,500 Kelvin and several points in between, as well as having the ability to dim. While the images on the left are an example of using four channels of LEDs, maybe red, blue, green, and white, maybe red, blue, green, and amber, whatever combination we choose, but mixed in certain proportions to create um, colors of our choice. So again, what we choose would depend on the application. Um, a little closer look at how a tunable light system um, 
is created. We can see on the right the uh, LED board has alternating chips of the two extreme color temperatures. So um, driving the two different channels in, in some proportion gives you a range of color temperatures that you, you know, would find beneficial in your application. And then the effect of that, the cool white or neutral or warm as it changes, you can see on the bench top on the left. Um, and then one other thing to really consider as we're developing these systems is that there is a complexity to them. There's a compatibility issue that needs to be um, considered because as you um, add different elements, you have to be sure that your drivers and your LED boards and your control system and your sensors and your software and mobile applications, that everything is going to work together because it is a system. Lighting is no longer about just a light bulb. It's, you know, it's systems, it's data collection, and it's providing improved environments for um, everyone that we are trying to create these environments for. So the human-centered lighting tools at our disposal are many, whether it's natural or electric light, candlelight, or the sun, warm or cool, bright or dim, single channel, multi-channel, static or dynamic, the way we choose and use the lighting tools we have will impact functional, biological, and emotional well-being, the very definition of human-centric lighting.